Hi, welcome to Fundamentals Friday. Today we're going to take a look at one of the most fundamental components in electronics, the Zener diode. Let's take a look at it. Now, you're no doubt familiar with the regular uh, silicon diode, and we've got our uh, Schottky diode as well. Same thing for the purposes of today's talk, but we're going to look at the differences between a regular diode and a Zener diode, and we're going to take a look at how the Zener diode is useful in a bunch of different applications. Now, your regular diode like this, you're no doubt familiar that it conducts current in one direction, only it only allows current to flow through, hence why it's got that sort of arrow shape pointing in the direction of the conventional current flow. And if you try and reverse bias it, it doesn't allow current to flow back up. But the Zener diode, it's a bit different. It works exactly like a regular diode and allows current to flow through like that. And it has the same voltage drop, you know, 0.6 volts to a volt or thereabouts, but it has a special property where it also allows current to flow in the other direction. And you might say, what use is that? The whole point of a diode is that it blocks current going in one direction. Well, there's something very interesting about the Zener that makes it useful. Let's take a look. Now you should be familiar with the characteristic curve of a regular diode like this. Schottky diode is basically exactly the same except it has a smaller voltage drop. And as you can see on this characteristic curve here, also called an IV curve because it's I versus V, current versus voltage. You can see that until you get to about 0.6 volts, no current will basically flow through this. So if you've got less than 0.6 volts on the diode roughly, it won't conduct anything, it won't allow current to flow. But once it gets above that, what's called the knee, the diode knee here, then it, start, it can start to conduct current. Once you get above about 0.6 volts, temperature and device dependent and current dependent, it will allow current to flow. That's it. And if you reverse bias and put a negative voltage on, i.e. you go on this side of the curve here, no current flows. It just stays flat like that. Easy. Now, a Zener diode works exactly the same as a regular diode when you forward bias it, when you have current going down like this, and you get exactly the same characteristic response at the knee starts at about 0.6 volts and it starts to conduct current. But in the negative direction, when you try and put a negative voltage on here, i.e. you put the positive here and the negative here, and you try and make current flow in the reverse direction, a regular diode just won't conduct anything We'll talk about that later. But a Zener diode, when you reverse bias it and try and make current flow in the reverse direction, it will do nothing for a while. It'll do nothing, but then it'll actually start conducting like a diode in the opposite direction. Weird. And the voltage that it typically does that is called the Zener voltage, VZ, or it might be called the Zener knee voltage or something like that. So now we can start to annotate our characteristic graph here with some industry terminology. Up here we've got the forward characteristic, that is the characteristic of the Zener diode in the forward current direction, like that, with the forward voltage. And naturally we've got the reverse characteristic down here, which shows what happens when you try and push current in the other direction and you have reverse voltage on it with the Zener breakdown voltage. Now I actually hinted before that regular diodes may have something a bit unusual with them too. They actually act like Zener diodes, kind of, and so do Schottky diodes as well. We'll loop them in, lump them in the same thing. You know how I said when you reverse the voltage on them, they don't allow current to flow. That's what you typically think of a diode, and that's typically how it kind of works in practice. But ultimately, you get to a breakdown voltage, we'll call that VB here, and at that voltage it's actually going to do a very similar thing. It's going to break down or what's called avalanche in the other direction, very similar to a Zener diode. So you might go, Dave, what's the difference between a Zener diode and a regular diode? Well, regular diodes are not designed to work down in this uh, reverse characteristic region. They're uncontrolled, they're horrible, they drift with temperature and all sorts of, they're not designed to work down here. Zener diodes have been specifically manufactured, specifically doped uh, to actually have a quite a reasonable controlled characteristic in the reverse breakdown region. Regular diodes and shock heat diodes don't. So that's why you use Zener diodes and, uh, as opposed to regular diodes in the applications we'll see. But 
just be aware that regular diodes can do it as well and that will be the maximum reverse voltage of the diode typically before it breaks down. And the other thing with uh, diode breakdown voltages is it's usually very high. For example, a 1N914 diode, 4148, it might break down at, you know, 70 or 90 volts or something like that. You know, really not a very usable voltage in practical circuit. So it's effectively, it stops current flowing in the other direction direction for most practical voltages. You know, a 1N4007 breaks down at a thousand volts, for example. Uh, you know, so really they're not of practical value in that negative region. But xenodiodes have been specifically manufactured and doped to actually work at very usable and very useful breakdown voltages anywhere from two volts up to 30 volts or something like that or even higher and you can use that low and controlled Zener breakdown voltage for useful circuit applications. Beauty. Now just to completely mess with your mind, sorry but no uh, explanation on Zener diodes would be complete without actually at least mentioning this. There are two different types of Zener breakdown. The red one which we saw here is called avalanche breakdown and that's what happens at high voltages in regular diodes. But there's also another type of Zener breakdown actually called Zener breakdown. And it's actually this effect, the Zener effect, the Zener breakdown where Zener diodes get their name from the person who founded it, uh, physicist Clarence Zener way back before you were born. Now, I won't go into the details of doping the PN regions and all the physics involved in actually manufacturing diodes. It's outside the scope of this thing, really. I'm sure you can Google it if you want to find out more. But just be aware that the Zener effect, the Zener breakdown, is actually quantum tunneling. So quantum physics is involved in this sort of thing, hence why it was found by a physicist. Anyway, the Zener breakdown occurs at roughly about 5 volts or below. Anything above roughly 5 volts is going to be a different effect avalanche breakdown. So they're two physically different phenomena happening inside the Zener diode, or both, or a combination of both could be happening if it's near to that sort of 5 volt region. So, you know, like a, a 12 volt Zener diode will definitely be working as an avalanche breakdown and a 2.5 volt Zener diode would definitely be working in the Zener using the Zener effect it's called. But you don't need to know that and most people just go the Zener effect even though they're actually might be talking about an actual avalanche effect instead of a Zener effect. If you're talking about Zener diodes it's a Zener breakdown voltage doesn't matter which voltage it occurs at it's the Zener effect. And just a further clarification on the terminology here, the reverse breakdown voltage, I put VB before because I was talking about breakdown, but in the data sheet you'll find that as VR for regular diodes, so just stick with VR. Now let's take a look at uh, a typical implementation of a Zener diode here, and we're using the reverse characteristic, because if we use the forward characteristic, you might as well just use a diode, it's just a regular diode. So that's why in a circuit like this, oh I should put that, that's positive and that's negative there. So you use it in the reverse bias configuration. So we're looking at the Zener breakdown voltage. And now hopefully you can see why the Zener symbol is as it is. Look how it kinks up there and kinks down there. It looks exactly like the characteristic curve. Bingo! That's actually where the symbol comes from. Now some typical labels you'll find on a Zener diode data sheet are VZ, which is of course the Zener voltage, the knee voltage that it nominally happens at, and also there's the uh, current going through the Zener, which is called IZ, or it could be I test or something like that, but typically, or IZT for example, and then there's this other weird one, ZZ. What is ZZ? Z of course is impedance, so it's AC resistance, so it's effectively the resistance of the diode under AC test conditions. They usually specify it at a particular uh, frequency. There's actually an internal resistance in the Zener which you need to take into account when you implement it in your practical circuit and then of course you typically have a series resistor in series with your Zener as well. So this resistor is effectively inside the Zener diode. And this diode impedance or diode resistance is also known as the dynamic resistance because it's dynamic. It does actually change, it's not a fixed value. And you guessed it, it changes with current and also as with practically every component, T 
temperature as well. And not just your ambient temperature, the actual junction temperature of the Zener itself, because Zeners are used as uh, power devices typically, so they heat up, they dissipate power. Hmm, trap for young players. You know how I said diodes don't actually conduct anything in the reverse direction? Well, of course, that's not true. No component is ideal, and Zeners and diodes, uh, regular ones, have the same thing. They have a reverse leakage, so I drew this as zero because well, it effectively is. You can't really see it on the graph, typically, because you're talking milliamps down here, and the leakage is typically in the order of microamps, tens of microamps, things like that, for pretty much both types until, but as you can see, the knee here is not a sharp, bam, knee. It does start to taper like that, hence a real knee is not just a right angle, is it? No, it's shaped like a knee. Hmm, does the same thing. So let's take a look at some typical applications for Zener diodes, and there are two main applications. The first one we'll take a look at is regulation, i.e. voltage regulation, because you can see that the, well, you could have seen on the characteristic curve that the Zener produces a stable voltage once it hits that knee, and that can be used for regulation. So I'll take a look at the classic configuration where we've got an input voltage here, we've got a Zener dropper resistor here, RZ, and then we've got the Zener diode itself with its internal dynamic resistance, remember that, it's important, and that produces a voltage drop across it called VZ. Let's have a look for the particular case of a 1N4733, which might be a typical, uh, you know, medium power uh, voltage regulation Zener diode. So let's take the simple example where we've got no load here. So we're just generating a reference voltage here from an input voltage V in of 12 volts and uh, with the load open, so I've disconnected the load there, so we're only getting, we've got two components, the Zener diode and the dropper resistor here. So let's go to the data sheet to look at the test current, i.e. the nominal current for the given particular type of Zener that we've got to produce the nominal uh, voltage. And in this case, IZT, there's actually two version uh, values, IZT, we're looking at IZT1 here and ZZT1. Uh, they've got multiple ones just to show you the difference in the uh, dynamic resistance. Anyway, IZT is 50 milliamps and ZZT at that 50 milliamps is going to be 5 ohms, but we can actually ignore that as you'll see in a minute because it's a cup, you know, it's an order of magnitude at least uh, less than our dropper resistor is going to turn out to be. So we can just take it out of the equation to keep things simple. So what value dropper resistor RZ do we need? It's easy, it's going to be the input voltage minus the voltage we want, the Zener voltage 5.1, and that will give us the voltage drop across the resistor here. And then we're just following Ohm's law, resistance equals voltage divided by current. So it's the voltage drop across RZ divided by our Zener current, our 50 milliamps, our test current, because all the current flows through the Zener. There is no load, so it all flows through. And you punch that in, and that gives us a value of 138 ohms. So if you had 12 volts in and you wanted 5.1 volts from your Zener, you'd use 138 ohm, roughly, resistor. And you can now see why the uh, internal resistance, the dynamic resistance of the Zener, 5 ohms doesn't really matter, it's more than an order of magnitude out from the 138 ohms, especially when you've got no load. Doesn't matter. Easy. And that's all fine and dandy, and assuming your temperature didn't change, that Zener diode would happily regulate your voltage at 5.1 volts. But the definition of regulation is keeping a fixed voltage, regulating the output, when your input here varies in voltage. So let's go through again and see what happens. So if we actually go into our data sheet here and have a look at the value for ZZ, I actually read the wrong value off the table. It's supposed to be 7 ohms for this particular one, but we'll just stick with 5 ohms. You'll notice that at uh, IZ2, that second test current, which was uh, 1 milliamp instead of 50 milliamps, the dynamic resistance is like 500 ohms or something, it's absolutely huge. But the good thing about ZZ, you can read it from the table, it's, it is going to change with relative to the current, uh, somewhat fairly linearly, but you know, you can take that figure as a fairly stable one for most practical design calculations. So if we increase our voltage and increase our current through our diode, let's just stick with the same 5 ohm value. If we decrease our input voltage a bit, then we can uh, stick, still stick with the 5 ohm value, even though the dynamic resistance is going to go up a little bit. You've got to work from something, unless you had a full parametric graph from the data sheet, which often you don't get. 
So let's take the example where our input voltage changes from 12 volts we had before up to 15 volts. We've still got the same resistor. You can't change the resistor where after it's in your circuit. So our input voltage changes. How much variation on our Zener voltage do we get? I.e. How good is the regulation of this thing? Well, let's see, we need to get the differential. So with these figures, 15 volts, 138 ohms, and our uh, impedance, which now matters and comes into play because we've got a variation in our input or our load current. In this case, our load current hasn't changed, but our input has certainly changed. So our dynamic resistance comes into play here. So we calculate our current again, because it's gonna change, because our input voltage has changed. So it, once again, Ohm's law, the voltage drop across RZ here is the voltage on either side of it, 15 volts minus our 5.1 volts we had before. Let's just take it as uh, 5.1 before because we're just getting a rough differential here. And divided by 138 ohms, ohms law, 71.7 milliamps. We had 50 milliamps before, now it's gone up to 71.7 because we've increased our voltage. It's naturally what you'd expect. But here's where we get the difference in the current from what we had before, i.e. the delta. That's what that little triangle is. Don't be scared by the delta, it just means difference or change in. So the change is the value we have now, 71.7 milliamps, the value we had before, 50 milliamps. We've increased our current, we've changed our current, we've got a delta uh, current change of 21.7 milliamps. So our current's gone up, what does that do on the output? When you have the current flowing through here and it's higher than what it was before, before we had 5.1 volts here, VZ, for our nominal dynamic resistance, but now we've increased our current, there's gonna be extra voltage drop across this internal resistance. So, delta VZ, i.e. the change in our Zener voltage, the regulation, is equal to our delta in our current, our change in current, times our resistance, Ohm's law, nothing fancy here, equals 21.7 milliamps times five ohms, a change of 0.11 volts or thereabouts. So our regulator output voltage has gone from 5.1 volts to now 5.21 volts, 2% or thereabouts. So it's an okay sort of, you know, 2% voltage regulator. Yeah, kind of does the job. Not terrific, but okay. So you can see how even with no load on the output, Zener diodes aren't that great. And the other thing you might have noticed, we've got no load, no load current at all, but we're pissing away 50 milliamps or 70 milliamps just to regulate our 5.1 volts. That's ridiculous. You can use a 7805 regulator and regulate that 5 volts exactly the same and it takes bugger all quiescent current. This thing takes 50 or 70 milliamps quiescent current. They're hopeless as like a regular voltage regulator powering no load. So at low currents, they're very inefficient. And the other thing we have to be careful of, this is a one watt nominal power dissipation. Zener, are we within the power dissipation? Uh, limits of this particular Zener diode. Well, the power in the Zener diode is the voltage uh, of the Zener diode times the current, 5.1 times 50 milliamps, quarter of a watt. No worries. And you might be thinking, Dave, that quarter watt is gonna, that's a fair bit of power in just a little uh, package like that. It's gonna increase the junction temperature. Yes, it will. And that'll change the dynamic resistance and everything, and it, yeah, it gets more complicated. I could go into a lot more detail, but I don't think we have time. Now, unfortunately, it gets a little bit more complicated because, well, the real world is a little bit more complicated. Let's add our, our load back, and let's say our load has 50 milliamps. We've still got our 5.1 volts in a voltage. That's what we're shooting for. That's our regulation voltage. Our input is 12 volts again. Let's have a look. We've got to figure out a new value of RZ because 138 ohms we had last time may, well, it's almost certainly not going to work for this particular current because we've got now got two currents, one flowing down the load, but we also have to maintain that test current, that uh, bias current through the Zener diode. Remember that 50 milliamps we got from the data sheet. So we still need 50 milliamps down here, but we also have to account for our load down here. And let's assume our load current is 50 milliamps. Then we've got 50 milliamps down here, 50 milliamps down here, Kirchhoff's current law, we've got 100 milliamps flowing through our resistor here. So we work out the resistor value the same way. It's a differential volt. It's the voltage across the resistor. The difference, which is 12 volts V in, minus five, 
but instead of just the diode test current, we've now got the diode test current plus the load current. So it's a total of 100 milliamps. Eh, work it out, 69 ohms. Beauty, good year. But what happens if our load changes? What if you power in a microcontroller that draws 50 milliamps during operation, then it goes to sleep? What happens? Well, let's check it. When IL drops to zero, all of the current must flow through the Zener diode. We've got our 69 ohm resistor here because it's in circuit, we can't change it. So our voltage across the resistor is 12 minus, let's assume it's still 5.1 volts, doesn't change a huge amount, the regulations aren't reasonable, divided by our 69 ohm resistor, much lower than 138 we had before. We've now got 100 milliamps. All of that 100 milliamps is now flowing through the Zener. Ooh, better check the power dissipation to make sure we're still within limits of our Zener diode. PZ, 5.1 times 100 milliamps. It's now dissipating half a watt. Whew. It's still within our one watt capability of our Zener diode, but it may not have been. We may have found if we used a half watt Zener in there, it might cook. If we used a quarter watt Zener in there, which might have just been enough before when we we're dissipating a quarter watt in here, if our microcontroller went to sleep, magic smoke would escape from our Zener. Hmm. <laughs> You can see how it starts to get complicated. What if our load is changing all the time and our input voltage is changing all the time? You have to rejig all the calculations and check and get a compromise value for your Zener dropper resistor and uh, it, it's not pretty there, but they still, so as for a voltage regulator for power in a circuit, it's okay if you don't care about the efficiency of it and things like that, but they, as I said, they have more use in sort of more niche applications within bigger circuits and things like that, um, you know, reference voltages and stuff like that. But yeah, that's how regulation works. And you still got to do, even if you're using them in low power examples, you're still got to do the same sort of calculations. But this is why, uh, often, especially in reference circuits and things like that, you'll find that the Zener is actually powered from a constant current source. So it's driving a constant current through and it's, everything's much simpler. But anyway, that's basic Zener diode regulation. Can get quite complicated. And then if the temperature changes and the die temperature rises, and I'll let you redo the calculations as an exercise for when the resistance value changes and the input value changes and the temperature rises, go and find the temperature coefficient in the diode in the data sheet and have a play. Now the other huge application which I can spend an entire video on and I probably will in the future is clipping and more importantly clamping protection circuits. So uh, not only used in sort of like audio applications if you want to clip a, an audio waveform for example, it might be some audio file reasons why you might want to do that. Um, but one of the big ones is protection. Let's say you've got your IC here, be it a microcontroller or whatever it is, you can actually use Zeners for protection. They're actually pretty decent devices for protection. And uh, you have the series current limiting resistor, of course, and the Zener can clamp the voltage. Let's say you're powering your circuit from five volts here, you might choose say a 5.1 volt uh, Zener like this, and it can, if you've got a huge spike on your input here, it might go up to 50 volts or something, you choose a suitable resistor, you calculate the power dissipation and things like that, and you will, it'll clamp it at 5.1 volts so you don't blow up your chip. Beauty. And the good thing about this is that also, in the other direction, if this input goes negative, what happens? It acts like a normal diode. It conducts and clamps it to 0.6 volts below the rail here, and we'll be able to demonstrate this. Now, I won't go through the full math for choosing the correct input uh, value, as I said, separate video, but take the 1N4733 diode we had before, the 5.1 volts, it's got a nominal 1 watt capability, but if you have a look at the data sheet, it's also got a surge current as well. For this particular one, it's about 900 milliamps, and that's like at 5.1 volt clamping, that's like 4.5 watts, but if you read the little asterisk down the bottom of the data sheet, it tells you that only applies for 10 milliseconds. And there's actually a typical, you can get uh, typical derating curves and things like that. Here's an example of how you can derate uh, the power. And from that, you can just calculate how much power or pulse power you can actually get in a particular component. But yeah, that's uh, some data sheets don't have that at all. And there's one neat little configuration, which is two Zener diodes series here and what this does, let's say we've got an audio waveform coming in like this, it's going positive and negative, it's an AC uh, waveform, then 
this, this Zener diode here is operating in the reverse characteristic, and this one's operating in the forward characteristic, so it's operating just like a diode here. So when the waveform goes positive, it's going to clamp it at the particular voltage of that Zener, plus the 0.6 volts drop across this other Zener, which is acting in the positive region, acting like a diode, and it'll clamp your waveform at the whatever value you choose for these zeners. And then when the waveform goes negative, the reverse happens. This one here is operating in the reverse characteristic. This one here is operating as a diode. It does the same thing. It clamps your negative waveform at the zener voltage plus 0.6 volts. And we can demo these sort of things. And there's lots of other clamping applications and clipping circuits and all sorts of weird and wonderful configurations you can do with Zeners. This is one of their huge applications. And check it out, if we use our Roden Schwartz HMO scope here, it's got a built-in component tester, and bingo, we can get the characteristic curve. Which voltage do you think this is? Oh, let's have a look here. We've got current on the vertical scale, so it's an IV characteristic curve. So it goes, look, up to 10 milliamps, down to minus 10 milliamps here, and voltage on the x-axis here, hence the V. So Bingo, we've got our 0.6 volts there of our characteristic, uh, that's the forward characteristic and our reverse characteristic. Bingo, it's about 5 point something-ish. It's actually a 5.1 volt Zener. Beauty. And if we swap it around in the other direction, what's going to happen? You guessed it. The characteristic is in the other direction. 0.6 volts here, 5.1 volts there. Beauty. Now, although this doesn't let me expand the uh, scale here, you can actually still see the knee in there is not a really sharp, and that line there is not actually vertical. It actually slopes slightly in that direction due to, you guessed it, the dynamic resistance. And if we just have a rudimentary example here with a 5.1 volt uh, Zener I just got out of the junk bin, chose a 1K dropper resistor, eh, whatever, I don't know the data sheet for it, just put in a, you know, a nominal resistance value, might be a bit high, but whatever. Anyway, we can see that when we switch it on, it's going to regulate at roughly 5.1 volts, no worries, and that's like 7.5 volts input here. So, as you can see, if we go down below the threshold, it's just going to go down as well. It's not going to regulate, but anything above 5.1, there we go, we're up at 10, but you'll notice that it is actually going up, and that's due to, of course, the dynamic resistance we just learned about. What I've done here is drop the resistor by an order of magnitude down to 100 ohms or so, and if we actually go right up to 15 volts here, let's have a look. Uh, we're now getting 5.4 volts, but look, it's actually increasing, increasing, increasing because the junction temperature of our Zener is going up. So there you go. Whoopsie. It's not regulating too well, is it? Hmm. And there's a bigger differential. It went from 5.22 volts up to 5.47 volts as opposed to with the 1K it went from, uh, there was only a 100 millivolt uh, change basically. Now there's like 200 plus millivolts uh, differential. Big difference. And a very simple clamping example here, I've got a 5.1 volt Zener, a 1K dropper, and the yellow wave forms the input, uh, it's uh, just a 7 volt uh, square wave which just goes down to, it goes between 1 and 7, uh, and the blue wave forms the output across the Zener diode, and you can see both 1 volt per division, the Zener diode clamps that output voltage at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 volts. So I've got both uh, channels set to the same ground position or reference there, and it clamps the output nicely, and it's going to do it very, very sharply. There's going to be no issues there whatsoever in terms of uh, response time and stuff like that. But you can see, if we go in there, aha, look at that. That is our input, and our output, that is due to our dynamic resistance. It's not going to follow it precisely. It is not an ideal Zener diode. So, yeah, but it's not going to overshoot. It's never going to overshoot. Beautiful for clamping. I'll just show you the difference between the 1K and the 100 uh, ohm resistor here. I've got a 1K in there at the moment, and I'll keep the same uh, time base, and you can see it has a particular uh, characteristic response. Let's pack, whack in the 100 ohm. There we go. It is significantly sharper. 
Now I'm going to show you the AC clipping. Uh, there's the zero volt point for both waveforms. Blue's the output again. Uh, I'm feeding in uh, 15 volts uh, peak to peak on the yellow waveform there. And you can see the blue one is definitely clipping. Look at that. Bingo. And what's it clamping at? Two volts per division and two, four, six. It's a, these are both 5.1 volt zeners. It's because of that additional diode drop operating the forward characteristic region that adds in not quite not 0.6 volts in this case it's gone up to one volt because of the current and everything else the characteristic but there you go it's added the 5.1 to the diode drop positive and negative clamping neat and just to show you that Zener diodes don't work at arbitrarily low currents, I've got my Keithley current source here, 5.1 volt uh, Zener. I've got, uh, this is the decimal point, this is the milliamp mode, so I've got one zero, that's 10 milliamps. Okay, and we get in our 5.1 volts. It's, you know, hunky-dory, I can go like, whoa, right, oh, whoa, it's getting a bit, you know, it's getting a bit, how you doing, when we go up in current towards 100 milliamps. Anyway, let's drop it down a range, okay, so we're now on one milliamp, it's still working just fine. Let's go down to the microamp range, so we're 100 microamps now. Look, 100 mic is 9.45 volts. It's starting to drop. What happens if we go down to 10 microamps? Uh-oh, not looking too good, is it? One microamp. Nope. So you can't go down to arbitrarily low current. Zener diodes don't work at low currents like this, even with a 10 volt compliance voltage. Look. Right, uh, 10 volts is plenty of compliant, this is the maximum, uh, the compliance voltage means the maximum this current source will output. Even if I go up to 100 volts, compliance source, okay, it's a 100 volt power supply, but it's a constant current of one microamp. It just can't do it. It's not enough current for the Zener to operate at. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that look at Zener diodes. It's been much longer than I thought. I thought I could maybe do this in 15 minutes. Nah, it's been at least double that. Sorry. Anyway, um, if you want to cover Zener diodes, sort of, and we didn't even go completely in depth here, yeah, these sort of things take time. Fundamentals take time to learn, unfortunately. Anyway, if you liked the video, please give it a big thumbs up, discuss below, all that sort of stuff. Hope you enjoyed it. Catch you next time. Today we're taking a look at a real basic building block circuit called the peak detector. Now, what a peak detector is, if you've got an analog uh, input signal that you want to know what value it peaks at, as the name suggests. If you've got your, it could be a voltage like that, you want the positive peak voltage on that, or negative. It's much easier to do it with two simple components. Turns out all you need to do for a peak detector